But Schmendrick, standing behind him, said quietly, Your Majesty, it may not be. You must not follow her. The king turned, and he looked like Haggard. Magician, she is mine. He paused, and then went on in a gentler tone, close to pleading. She has twice raised me up from death, and what will I be without her but dead for a third time? He took Schmendrick by the wrists in a grip strong enough to powder bones, but the magician did not move. Lear said, I am not King Haggard. I have no wish to capture her, but only to spend my life following after her, miles, leagues, even years behind, never seeing her, perhaps, but content. It is my right. A hero is entitled to his happy ending when it comes at last. But Schmendrick answered, this is not the end, either for you or for her. You are the king of a wasted land where there has never been any king but fear. Your true task has just begun, and you may not know in your life if you have succeeded in it, but only if you fail. As for her, she is a story with no ending, happy or sad, and she can never belong to anything mortal enough to want her. More strangely, then, he put his arms around the young king and held him for a time. Yet be content, my lord, he said in a low voice. No man has ever had more of her grace than you, and no other will ever be blessed by her remembrance. You have loved her and served her. Be content and be king. But that is not what I want, Lear cried. The magician answered not a word but only looked at him. Blue eyes stared back into green, a face grown lean and lordly, into one neither so handsome nor so bold. The king began to squint and blink, as though he were gazing into the sun, and it was not long before he lowered his eyes and muttered, So be it. I will stay and rule alone over a wretched people in a land that I hate. I will, but I will have no more joy of my rule than poor Haggard ever had. A small autumn cat with a crooked ear stalked out of some secret fold in the air and yawned at Molly. She caught him up against her face, and he tangled his paws in her hair. Schmendrick smiled and said to the king, We must leave you now. Will you come with us and see us in friendship to the edge of your domain? There is much between here and there that is worth your study, and I can promise you that there will be some sign of unicorns. Then King Lear shouted for his horse again, and his men searched for it and found it. But there were none for Schmendrick and Molly. Yet, when they came back with the king's horse, they turned at his amazed stare and saw two more horses trailing docilely behind them one black and one brown, and both already saddled and bridled. Schmendrick took the black for himself, and gave the brown horse to Molly. She was afraid of them at first. Are they yours? she asked him. Did you make them? Can you do that now? Just make things? The king's whisper echoed her wonder. I found them, the magician answered. But what I mean by finding is not what you mean. Ask me no more. He lifted her into the saddle, and then leaped up himself. So the three of them rode away, and the men-at-arms followed on foot. No one looked back, for there was nothing to see. But King Lear said once, without turning, It's strange to have grown to manhood in a place, and then to have it gone, and everything changed, and suddenly to be king. Was none of it real at all? Am I real, then? Schmendrick made no reply. King Lear wished to go swiftly, but Schmendrick held them to a leisurely pace and a roundabout road. When the king fretted for speed, he was admonished to consider his walking men, though they, marvelously, never tired for all the length of the journey. But Molly stu soon understood that the magician was delaying in order to make Lear gazed long and closely at his realm, and to her own surprise, she discovered that the land was worth the look. For very slowly, 
Spring was coming to the barren country that had been Haggard's. A stranger would not have noticed the change, but Molly could see that the withered earth was brightening with a greenness as shy as smoke. Squat, snaggly trees that had never yet bloomed were putting forth flowers in the wary way an army sends out scouts. Long, dry streams were beginning to rustle in their beds, and small creatures were calling to one another. Smells slipped by in ribbons, pale grass and black mud, honey and walnuts, mint and hay and rotting applewood, and even the afternoon sunlight had a tender, sneezy scent that Molly would have known anywheres. She rode beside Schmendrick, watching the gentle advent of the spring, and thinking of how it had come to her late but lasting. Unicorns have passed here, she whispered to the magician. Is that the cause, or is it Haggard's fall and the red bull's going? What is it? What is happening? Everything, he answered her. Everything all at once. It is not one springtime, but fifty, and not one but two great terrors flown away, but a thousand small shadows lifted from the land. Wait and see. Speaking for King Lear's ear, he added, Nor is this the first spring that has ever been in this country. It was a good land long ago, and it wants little but a true king to be so again. See how it softens before you? King Lear said nothing, but his eyes roved left and right as he rode, and he could not but observe the ripening. Even the valley of Hagsgate, of evil memory, was stirring with all manner of wild flowers. Columbine and harebell, lavender and lupine, foxglove and yarrow. The rutted footprints of the red bull were growing mellow with mallow. But when they came to Hagsgate, deep in the afternoon, a strange and savage sight awaited them. The plowed fields were woefully torn and ravaged, while the rich orchards and vineyards had been stampled down, leaving no grove or arbor standing. It was such shattering ruin as the bull himself might have wrought, but it seemed to Molly grew as though fifty years' worth of foiled griefs had struck Hagsgate all at once, just as that many springtimes were at last warming the rest of the land. The trampled earth looked oddly ashen in the, in the late light. King Lear said quietly, What is this? Ride on, your majesty, the magician replied. Ride on. The sun was setting as they passed through the overthrown gates of the town and guided their horses slowly down streets that were choked with boards and belongings and broken glass, with pieces of walls and windows, chimneys, chairs, kitchenware, roofs, bathtubs, beds, mantles, dressing tables. Every house in Hagsgate was down. Everything that could be broken was. The town looked as though it had been stepped on. The people of Hagsgate sat on their doorsteps wherever they could find them, considering the wreckage. They had always had the air of paupers, even in the midst of plenty, and real ruin made them appear almost relieved and no whit poorer. They hardly noticed Lear when he rode up to them until he said, I am the king. What has befallen you here? It was an earthquake, one man murmured dreamily, but another contradicted him, saying, It was a storm, a nor'easter, straight off the sea. It shook the town to bits, and hail came down like hooves. Still another man insisted that a mighty tide had washed over Hagsgate, a tide as white as dogwood and heavy as marble that drowned none and smashed everything. King Lear listened to them all, smiling grimly. Listen, he said when they were done. King Haggard is dead, and his castle has fallen. I am Lear, the son of Hagsgate, who was abandoned at birth in order to keep the witch's curse from coming true, and this from happening. He swept an arm around him at the burst houses. Wretched, silly people. The unicorns have returned. 
the unicorns that you saw the red bull hunting and pretended not to see. It was they who brought the castle down and the town as well. But it is your greed and your fear that have destroyed you. The townsfolk sighed in resignation, but a middle-aged woman stepped forward and said with some spirit, It all seems a bit unfair, my lord, begging your pardon. What could we have done to save the unicorns? We were afraid of the Red Bull. What could we have done? One word might have been enough, King Lear replied. You'll never know now. He would have wheeled his horse and left them there, but a feeble, rupee voice called to him, Lear! Little Lear! My child! My king! Molly and Schmendrick recognized the man who came shuffling up with his arms open, wheezing and limping as though he were older than he truly was. It was Drin, 